this episode, guys, we're going to be reading an interview with Atari's new creative director, Tim Lapatino, talking about Atari's legacy. And of course, this is by uh, Ian Dean from Creative Block. Let's take a look next on Atari Newsline. You are, you are watching, watching Ballistic, Ballistic Coffee, Coffee Boy. Boy. Welcome back, you guys. BCB here, your host. So ever since Atari uh, got Tim Lapatino as their creative director, I have been his biggest fan. He was a special guest on our show, on that Atari show, about a year ago or so. And just a great guy um, who's just immersed in Atari art and history, and he's just fantastic. So I want to read this interview that I really enjoyed. This came out uh, April 2nd by Creative Blog, by Ian Dean. It says, the Atari logo has become a container for people's feelings. New creative director Tim Lapatino defines Atari's legacy. The retro game brand's past explored and bright future teased. Few game brands have as much instant recognition as Atari. The US games publisher and developer holds a unique place in pop culture. A heritage brand that's also an icon, it can instantly take many gamers and non-gamers back to a place in time. Few brands hold this influence. Perhaps only the likes of Apple, Sega, and Nike can claim to have influenced the broader pop culture of a time. Atari has passed through many hands over the years, often becoming a licensed brand to support others. Its uniqueness capable of lending authority to other brands. In 2024, Atari is having a renaissance. It's back to being a game developer as well as a publisher. It's making new hardware and unique retro consoles like the Atari 2600 Plus, and now owns acclaimed developers Digital Eclipse and Night Dive Studios. Times are looking up for this iconic US brand. Atari has renowned for bringing back the master of bringing back the best retro game consoles, and has even found a gap to release a replica of niche retro home computer, the Atari 400 Mini, and as new games releasing on the best games consoles like PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. So why the resurgent success? The newly hired creative director Tim Lapatino says, firstly, we need to recognize Atari made great games. He tells me, we wouldn't be having this conversation today if Atari didn't make amazing games. In the 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s, right? So you've got to have a great product, and I think Atari was a pioneer and it really captured something of the zeitgeist of those eras. And this picture here, it says the Atari logo is a cultural icon that has barely been altered or redesigned since the 1970s. Atari logo is great, but the games matter. He's correct, of course. Many associate Atari with their childhoods. My first games console was an Atari 2600, and I have fond memories of fighting my brother for games from Space Invaders and Combat on a black and white CRT TV. It's also the style of game, says Tim, that makes Atari feel unique in the mind's eye. The easy-to-learn, difficult-to-master idea is core to the Atari brand, pinpoints Tim. I think also there's the idea that Atari was never just a video game company, begins Tim. It was always speaking to the larger culture, always pushing the boundaries of being cemented in video games and entertainment. It felt in fashion. This is how Atari is beginning to grow again, but exploring how the brand can be harnessed outside of just being known for games, though this side of the brand is now possibly more important than ever with internally developed, self-published new Atari games on the horizon. Atari X, for example, the publisher's popular blockchain experiment with artist Butcher Billy, while new versions of iconic games and new games like Jeff Mentor's Aka R continue to broaden Atari's fan base. There's a picture here. It says, Atari is tapping into the heritage of using leading illustrators for its game promotion. These days, it's Butcher Billy. In recent years, Atari has played up to its heritage, becoming a new icon of the rise in retro gaming. Over the years, Atari as a brand has adopted a new meaning in a cultural context. It's become synonymous with a particular kind of nostalgic clamor for simpler but perhaps more innovative games. 
Atari has a connection to all things retro. That really transcends the games that we made in the 70s and 80s and 90s, says Tim. But it's also an association for something that is cool and hip. And multiple generations of gamers and even pop culture folks know Atari as a heritage brand. And these pictures here, it says, Before the iconic Mount Fuji design, Atari looked at a number of logos, including these six designs shared by Tim, before the classic three-line design was settled upon. Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and Atari's startup. There's something very American and celebratory Californian about Atari. When you think of Atari, you imagine casual plaid shirts, lazy sunshine beer Fridays, and groundbreaking tech. It conjures images of risk-taking and tech dreamers. It's not a surprise that Atari can name-drop the likes of Steve Jobs as early foundational hired hands. Steve Wozniak on hit Atari game Breakout. As Tim tells me, Atari in the 70s was a startup before startup culture existed. A major part of making this cannonball of a new studio land was, of course, that logo. Naturally, games like Pong helped. But Atari was a new kind of game developer with one eye on marketing, and after all this was a decade of t-shirt movies like Jaws and Star Wars. The logo is just a great design, begins Tim. It's an iconic design, and that helps us stand the test of time. It doesn't feel dated. It feels like it could have been created yesterday, and it still doesn't feel so stuck in the past that it feels like a relic. And there's a really cool picture here. It says, Atari is a gaming brand that has been going for more than 50 years. The Atari logo has gathered its own history over the years and differs depending on who you listen to. In Tim's own book, Art of Atari, he shares some competing tales of how the logo came about. Designer George Opperman once said, in a 1983 interview, in Video Games Magazine, the logo was influenced by the force of Pong's ball hitting its pixel bats. In other interviews, Atari creative director George Farrako called this nonsense, while co-founder Nolan Bushnell has commented in the past how he felt George Opperman would create playful narratives to tease why the Atari logo looks the way it does. This grew over the years, with many believing that Very American Games brand owned its logo design to Mount Fuji. Brands acquire meaning over time. That's what we do. As brand designers, logo designers, creative people, we create something. But then it's up to both the brand and the people who care about it to fill it with meaning, says Tim. The creative director then says, thoughtfully, I think the Atari logo has become a container for people's feelings about those eras in their childhoods, and great games and the idea of innovative electronics, like all of all of those things get poured into that logo, and so now the logo stamp says something much more than when it was created by George Opperman in the, in the 70s. There's a picture here. It says, George Opperman, Atari's original creative director, set a new standard for game box art and illustration. Recalling Atari's iconic box art and illustration. Fascinatingly, the Atari logo has rarely changed in over the 50 years since its launch. Save for a few minor tweaks or cosmetic changes, the Atari logo has stayed the same as it did in 1973 when it adorned the side of an arcade cabinet for the game Space Race. Like everything, logo design is subject to fashion and fads, reflects Tim, when I joke how strange it is for a logo to never really change. He explains, There's always a thought that simple is better, and distilling logos down to their basic elements is always going to make something that you know will not only stand the sense of time, but also just really feels timeless. It can sit above trends and fashion, and it can rise above changing styles. Those will come and go, and all brands need to pay attention to that. But you need a brand identity that can sort of transcend it all. Here's a cool picture here of some cards. It says, the original Atari 2600 game cartridges featured the same high concept illustration as the brand's advertising. Just as the logo has proved iconic, so has the Atari box art. Illustrators such as Steve Hendricks and Cliff Spoon were hired to create energetic, hand-painted, and sophisticated art for each game's box cover. These artists came from the print tradition and transferred that high-end look into Atari's game's packaging. These days, Atari's box art, which comprises vivid montages of action more reminiscent of blockbuster movie posters, even when the action was chess, can feel as if Atari was overselling its games. But remember, Atari was delivering bleeding-edge technology into homes, and as someone who owned Space Invaders, Breakout, and Missile Command, I can attest any perceived disconnect between art and game never existed. 
apart perhaps video chess, which looks epic. The truth is, those games were innovative and really interesting. It wasn't like they were trying to make simple, unsophisticated games, says Tim. That was the state of the art at the time. But the thinking on the artwork was very much about capturing the feeling and the emotion and the energy of playing those games. Because don't forget, sitting in your living room playing a game on your television was still a really new idea. Setting a new standard for game art. Tim explains how the Atari artists and creative directors of the time were focused on finding the touch point for often abstract games like Super Breakout and Missile Command. The aim was to prime players for the experience they're going to have and create a real-world, relatable connection. It was very much about capturing that energy and that experience and preparing people for what they were going to see when they plugged that cartridge into the console and turn it on, says Tim. This was the 8-bit era when a game's protagonist was defined by two or three pixels and the art needed to fill in the gaps. Atari's approach to its illustrated box art formed a world players could immerse themselves in. It told stories and became an integral part of the gameplay experience. In a similar way, music fans would sit and listen to a record while pouring over an album sleeve. Atari's commitment to illustrative art filled in the gaps between gameplay and imagination that three pixels couldn't reach. A lot of it comes back to the original creative director, George Opperman, who was an illustrator and a designer and a creative director, considers Tim. If you look at some of the other video game companies at the time, they didn't have Atari's strong editorial style of art direction that came from corporate design or magazine design or magazine illustration, which is the place where George came from. And he really brought the sophisticated art style from things like movie posters and paperback novels. They appropriated that and brought it into the world of video games, and that was a huge renovation. Here is a picture here of Missile Command um, art. It says, as well as being Atari's creative director, George Opperman also painted some of Atari's uh, most iconic box art, including this illustration for Missile Command. So classic. Everything ties together with Tim at the helm as Atari's new creative director. His passion for the brand, its legacy of art, design, and games is unavoidable, and that runs through this new incarnation of Atari. The release of the acclaimed Atari 50, the anniversary celebration for all the best games, consoles, brought together five decades of branding, marketing, and game design and doing games collection. It beautifully highlighted the impact Atari has made over the decades on game design, but also on pop culture more broadly. Digital Eclipse just killed it with that, and they really did an incredible job on that game, says Tim, excitedly. Seeing a hundred Atari games in one collection supported by interviews, art, and behind-the-scenes insights brought the brand's legacy to life in a visceral way. I think you can look at any of those individual games and say, oh, I really like this, or this is really hard or challenging, or maybe that's not my thing. But taken as a whole, I think they really provide a bigger story that I think people can get wrapped in and see these games as different steps, stones, and different stories along the way of this larger brand story, comments Tim. Here are some cool, I think these are arcade art pictures. It says, Atari's illustrated advertising and arcade cabinet design set a new standard and have become collector's items. Very cool. The Tension of Atari's Legacy More recently, the Atari 2600 Plus launched to rave reviews, demonstrating the unique position of the Atari brand for modern audiences. This new full-size console enables old Atari cartridges to be played on a modern TV. The console is a replica of the same machine that was released in 1977. It's both a celebration of the past and taps into the modern zeitgeist for indie game design innovation over graphics and retro rivals. Tim refers to this as the brand's wonderful tension, its ability to remain relevant and while having something to say from a brand perspective in 2024 and beyond, while also continuing to hold, nurture, and talk about Atari's rich history. Those two things are intertwined, he says. It's what all really good brands do, and I think it is an amazing opportunity to come to a brand like Atari that has such a rich history and, and the company is not only not afraid of, but actively embraces. You know, and I've worked with so many different companies over the years in my role as a design consultant, and my different clients and different companies have a different relationship with their past. Some of them want to start fresh. They want to blow it up, or they want to minimize it, or they want to just strip mine it. But Atari has a different way. 
The team and everybody else who's involved really gets a sense that is valuable. We want to continue that Atari story, and we want to make sure that we keep telling that story. Visit the Atari website to discover what this retro game brand has coming in 2024. And Ian Dean uh, is editor, digital arts, and 3D for creativeblock.com. Uh, says he's former editor of many leading magazines. These included Imagine FX, 3D World, and leading video game title official PlayStation magazine. So thank you so much, Ian, for that great interview. It was fantastic. Let me know, guys, what you think down below about this, in, this article with Tim Lapatino. Um, just a great guy. Um, of course, he was on that Atari show um, about a year ago. I'll put the link down below. He was fantastic, and we talked a lot about box art, game art, and why that mattered, and how iconic it is, and just how it sold the games back in the day. Um, just fantastic. So I wanted to appreciate Ian for this great article. It was awesome. I love anything about art and Atari. So make sure to check this out, you guys. Um, just fantastic. So I also just wanted to let you know, um, on Monday... Coming up on April 8th, I will have a really cool episode uh, talking about my 1,000th video upload on YouTube. Make sure to check that out this Monday at 10 a.m. in the morning. Um, we'll see you guys there. Be a good person, get your Java, and go play some Atari. And subscribe, like, and comment. Thank you, guys. We'll see you later. Bye now. One of the first games we ever got was video pinball. And um, I remember I was like six or seven, maybe. I can't remember. This came out in 1980, but I think we got it later. I think it was six or seven. But I remember seeing this in in, in the Sears or wherever we were, the um, Montgomery Wards, or I can't remember where we were, probably Sears, because we had a Sears Telegames in the beginning. And I remember seeing this and going, yeah, I want that. Yeah, yeah. Just because, I mean, look at it. It's so... It's almost, I don't want to say Escher, not Escher-like, but maybe, you know, like how it's got different dimensions to it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and when I saw that, I wanted it. And then it's funny. My sister and I played this game for days and months. And, you know, this is also one of my favorites because it takes me back, you know, a nostalgic uh, kind of factor. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the box art sold me on the game, you know? <laughs> and uh, in my mind, that's what it looked like when I was a kid, you know? So... Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I played the heck out of that game as well, you know, and I think, you know, people look now look at it and be like, oh, that's false advertising. And I, <laughs> but I don't, I don't think that's the desire, you know, I th the yeah. goal wasn't like, let's, you know, get you to buy this and then we're going to give you something inferior. It was for the artist, it was about capturing the emotion and the feelings behind what a pinball game would be like. You know, sometimes the artists didn't even get a chance to play the game before they were doing the art. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. It really depended. But also some of this was just to give give people a comfort level. You know, there's a lot of people who were scared to plug a video game system into their TV. You know, they were worried that a video game system would blow up their TV or it would turn their kids into zombies, you know, or, you know, something like that. And so the idea of capturing a little bit of the emotion of what it would be like to play tennis or chess or something like that gave people a comfort level. And I think with something like pinball, it wasn't about literally showing you what the game was like. It was about capturing a bit of the, the energy and the emotion behind that. And that was what was going to draw you into this new thing of video games.
You are watching Ballistic Coffee Boy. You are, you are watching, watching Ballistic, Ballistic Coffee, Coffee Boy. Boy.